For much of the communist period, you had a small group of dissidents who were, in essence, non-political. They didn't strive for political power for themselves. They simply wanted a different system. Their reference point, in other words, what they wanted to live like, was Western Europe. I said, why aren't we living like they are in, uh, and, and fill in the blank, in France, in the UK, in the US? Their core demand was to, quote unquote, reappropriate society from the Communist Party. In other words, to, to, to dismantle the system of vertical links that we talked about before, where the horizontal links were, were cut apart, to show people that they weren't alone. So they tried to create a, this parallel society, for example, publishing their own literature that would compete with the state take on things that was in the state press. They were effective to the, to the degree that they pointed out failures in the system and they spread doubt about its viability, especially as communist countries struggled through financial crises in the 1970s and 1980s. Um, I guess a, a big discussion question that I wanted to ask, and I don't know, I'll, I'll just throw it out here, is how did dissidents avoid the collective action dilemma? Well, I'll just answer this one. I probably won't put it up. They were people who felt that they were cleansing themselves by rejecting the system, right? These internal payoffs. This made activity a benefit and not a cost, which is, again, what we see often in social movements as well, where activity is a benefit, not a cost. The dissident community could not be easily bought off because of the internal payoffs that Kuran described in his piece. Um, now, uh, that's within the dissident community. That's why you don't have free riders there, and that's how you avoid the collective action dilemma. But outside of the dissident community, uh, obviously you have lots of people who are unwilling to engage in that sort of protest activity. This goes back to the threshold. So as these dissidents acted, the majority of society largely ignored them. Because these dissidents, these dissidents could be seen as outliers. They weren't the quote-unquote regular people. And they were certainly no indication that others would happily join the fight. If I'm looking at these dissidents, I think of them as somewhat different, right? Um, for all I know, there are a bunch of crazies who, who, uh, who oppose the system irrationally, right? They're the only ones besides me who don't like the system, and I'm not willing to stand up for that because it could get me in big trouble. This is the problem that many pro-democracy NGOs around the world face. NGOs are seen as outliers. They're seen as distant from their populations. And so people don't look at them, and it doesn't affect people's threshold. People don't look at them and say, hey, if they're standing up for this, well, I should too. Um, they're really incapable of directly lowering the threshold. But they may be able to, with time, indirectly lower people's thresholds or, or help people meet their thresholds by demonstrating a long stream of human rights abuses that over time add up and people get aggravated by. Now, the fact that society didn't get involved with these NGOs didn't mean that society was in line with the regime. And they could still engage in what we call everyday resistance. These are things like foot dragging, don't do exactly what you're told to do. False compliance, pretend to do what you're told to do, but don't really do it. Pilfering, stealing from the state. Um, feigned ignorance, incompetence, right? Pretend you just don't know how to do whatever you're being instructed to do. Slander. Arson. Arson and sabotage are also elements of this. Uh, we don't go further than that. We don't have um, people blowing up, uh, blowing up government buildings, but you could have sabotage, for example, of railway lines um, so that the, the government can't bring goods and people to where it wants them to. Uh, this is also referred to as passive resistance. Importantly, the goal here is short-term and small-scale. It's not about regime overturn. Everyday resistance isn't about uh, getting rid of the regime, but it's about attacking and, and weakening particular policies of the regime and having a better life in the meantime. Right? You can imagine how some of these things would, would affect what we call these, uh, these internal payoffs. Right? I feel better because I'm attacking the regime. I'm, I'm showing the man where, uh, where, where the government really stands. Um, all these things can also go further than the short-term goal, though. 
because they can serve to challenge the social order and the power of the state. They can set a broader example. Everyone says that the regime is right, right? Because of this preference falsification, false, preference falsification. And that leads to mute, this mutual reinforcing mechanism, right? If everyone says it's right, well, then I'm not going to say it's wrong. I'm going to say it's right, too. And so everyone, you get more and more of this preference falsification. If people objected, it would put a big hole in the regime. And this encourages people to move away from complicity. So by challenging the social order from below, what you're doing is you're no longer showing, like we saw in the North Korean case, those, the, the shop window signs of propaganda, right? You're no longer supporting the regime to the same degree. You're beginning to show your true colors. And this is a, a frequent form of activism, or at least activity, in states where collective action is especially costly. These costs might occur because the regime is so oppressive. But they can also be a function of demographics. And if you read the Scott piece, um, you'll see that he focuses more on rural populations. Because scattered populations means higher what we call transaction costs, the costs of engaging in action. Right? Uh, it's harder to disseminate information. Uh, it's harder to meet right? if people are coming from all over the place. It's more costly, more time consuming. It's harder to organize. All these things, rural populations make this more difficult, okay? And also lower levels of socioeconomic status, lower educations, a lack of a middle class means that you lack leadership. You lack people with the know-how and the time to lead these sorts of uh, organizations or movements. And that's why you end up with what we call everyday resistance. People doing it on their own, and they're not trying to topple the regime. They're trying to get by, and they're trying to, they're trying to hit the regime and certain policies of the regime at the same time. Everyday resistance is often the policy choice in non-democracies where there are no open or formal institutions for action, where more open or active resistance can lead to state repression, and there's a lack of loyalty to the state, where the state doesn't, for example, provide promised goods. So let's look at this in the communist context. The communist world, even at its heart in the Soviet Union, was victim to these sorts of acts of everyday resistance. Shoddy products, petty corruption, really deteriorated the system slowly but surely. At the core of this was uh, the Russian term, it's balat. It's personal influence in return for favors in the black or gray illegal market. And here's how the process played out. The communist system was a centrally planned system. Each producer, whether they produced airplanes, electricity, carrots, whatever it was, they needed supplies of inputs to produce the mandated outputs. And they had quotas. Here are the number of carrots you had, well, the kilograms and carrots that you had to provide. Here are the number of airplanes you need to provide, etc. But to make your quota of airplanes, you need everything, all these inputs from screws to, to, to sheet metal. To make carrots, you need all these inputs from fertilizer to pesticides. Everything involves some sort of inputs. And someone else is making those things. Fertilizer, sheet metal, uh, pesticides. And these supplies were far from guaranteed. The system was prone to breakdown. No one wanted that breakdown to fall on their heads. I'm the factory manager responsible for producing the airplanes. I don't want to be the one who, who comes up shy of my quota. So what do you do? Well, factory managers and other producers were forced to use an informal procurement system based on this blot, these informal connections. People would supply others with inputs by saying that they were rejects when they really weren't, and they would pass them on as blot. In other words, um, the factory manager over there producing screws would, would pilfer some of the screws, and he'd give them to me in the airplane section because he didn't have enough to formally give to me. He'd give them to me, and he'd say that those screws... Um, he'd formally write up those screws as defective, and then he'd give um, those boxes of screws to me in my airplane business, business, my airplane com my airplane factory, so that I could produce my airplanes. And in return, I would do him a favor. Right? There were these informal connections and influence. And so Blot wasn't just used to procure inputs, but it was also even to used to deliver finished goods. After all, the trains and the trucks were also run by this centrally planned system. They were also mismanaged. They were underfueled. 
et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. They also depend on inputs to keep them running, maintenance, fuel. And so this went through the entire line, this use of blot. Blot and bribery are very loosely linked, but there are some important differences. Blot is based more on personal connections, whether close friendships or long-standing business partnerships uh, that involve built-up trust. And the reciprocal payments for paying each other are more assumed and long-term than immediate. I'm not going to immediately give you something for those screws, but you'll know that someday if you need some extra sheet metal, my factory tends to have a, a bunch of sheet metal, for example. Uh, or my, my nephew uh, can, can help you uh, repair your roof or fix your um, toilet, right? All these things. So they're not all directly connected. So you've got what, what, uh, what's referred to as this implication of reciprocation. It's not an explicit quid pro quo. It's, it's things happen sort of over time. But small gifts that are bribe-like help cultivate the blot system and grease the wheels of the entire machine, sometimes meaning that blot is a big earner for some people. So some people were actually getting rich off this blot because they were producing things that people needed. Still, and so that's where the corruption side sort of comes in. Still, what this means is that blot demands mutual trust which, remember, is a key ingredient for civil society. Now, all this fits into the weapons of the weak, Scott's paradigm, in that there's a stress on informal networks, including family, clan, the, the sort of extended family. It's about family and friends, but also you scratch my back and I'll scratch yours. So how does all this help undermine the state? Well, first of all, it creates a second market, a black market, which helps to undermine the state and show people coming together to address state failures. So the black market implicitly says that the state is failing, okay? And explicitly, directly, it allows you to go around the state, to undermine the state. So Blot also frustrated st state managers at the very top who were trying to decide what gets produced. By bringing into play real demand and supply forces, People who were engaging in blot were also challenging authorities. And it also created large groups of people who acknowledged the failures of the regime, as I mentioned, and it added fuel to the dissidents who spoke in code against the regime. And again, it increased uh, horizontal networks, the strength of horizontal networks. So all these things are really important. And uh, it sort of highlight how everyday resistance isn't just limited to rural agrarian communities and can be used in any non-democratic state. So uh, I'll stop there for right now.